For all its beauty and splendor, the wilderness can be a cruel teacher. Running an ultramarathon is an extraordinary journey that invites us to explore the profound depths of human endurance, resilience, and the sheer joy of pushing our limits. It's a true test of not just physical strength, but also mental fortitude and unwavering determination. The unforgiving terrain, harsh weather, and the relentless toll on your body pose formidable obstacles. Please click the subscribe and like buttons. This is Outdoor Disasters. The Sahara Desert, a vast sea of golden dunes and timeless landscapes, beckons us with its breathtaking beauty and mysterious allure. In the heart of the Sahara, where shifting sands, shaped by the winds of time, remind us of the ever-changing nature of life itself. The Sahara Desert is the largest hot desert in the world, covering an expansive area of approximately 3.6 million square miles, or 9.2 million square kilometers. It stretches across North Africa, spanning over a dozen countries. The Sahara is known for its extreme climate, characterized by scorching daytime temperatures that can exceed 120 degrees in some areas, as well as bitterly cold nights. Rainfall is exceptionally scarce, and many parts of the Sahara receive less than an inch of precipitation annually. The Sahara's landscape is dominated by vast sand dunes, rocky plateaus, and gravel plains. The iconic sand dunes, such as those in the Erg Chebi dune field in Morocco, can reach heights of over 500 feet or 150 meters. Despite its arid nature, the Sahara features pockets of life in the form of oases, where water flows to the surface, creating fertile areas with vegetation. These oases have historically been crucial for trade routes and settlements. The Sahara presents numerous challenges, including water scarcity, harsh climatic conditions, and limited arable land. The Sahara Desert is a region of stark beauty, ancient history, and unique ecological adaptations. It is a testament to the power of nature's artistry, a masterpiece of sand and sky that leaves an indelible mark on the human spirit. It calls to the adventurer within us, inviting us to explore its wonders. For Mauro Persoperi, his desert excursion would test the limits of human survival. In 1994, Mauro Prosperi, an Italian police officer and former Olympic pentathlete, sought to test his physical limits. At 39 years old, married with three young children, Mauro constantly sought new challenges to push himself. His quest led him to discover the Marathon de Sabo, also known as the Marathon of the Sands or the Sahara Marathon, hailed as the most grueling foot race on Earth. This annual ultramarathon spans six days, covering a staggering 156 miles, equivalent to completing six standard marathons. Set against the harsh backdrop of the Sahara Desert in southern Morocco, it's a relentless multi-stage adventure through a legendary terrain, one of the planet's harshest environments. Participants in this race must be entirely self-sufficient, carrying all their food and equipment on their backs for the entire week. Each night, communal goat's hair Berber tents are erected for shelter. But beyond that, competitors must bear the burden of their belongings. Water is strictly rationed and exceeding the allotted amount incurs a time penalty. Prosperi recalled his reaction to learning about the infamously difficult ultramarathon. I love a challenge, so I started training immediately running 40 kilometers a day, reducing the amount of water I was drinking to get used to dehydration. I was never home. My wife, Tinzia, thought I was insane. The race is so risky that you have to sign a form to say where you want your body to be sent in case you die. Following rigorous preparation, he boarded a flight to Morocco to commence the race. The 1994 event boasted a mere 134 participants, leaving Prosperi to navigate the majority of the six-day expedition in solitude. At the race's outset, organizers delivered a briefing, urging runners to seek shelter during sandstorms and advising them to head in the direction of the clouds forming at sunset if they became lost. Yet, as Prosperi recalls, there aren't many shelters in the desert. In the middle of the dunes, it's hard to find a place that will defend you. Mauro Prosperi's journey across the Sahara Desert was progressing smoothly. The fourth day of the Marathon de Sables was the longest single stage, spanning 57 miles or 92 kilometers between campsites. On April 14, 1994, scorching temperatures reached 115 degrees as Prosperi reached the third checkpoint. 
which was 20 miles or 48 kilometers into the day's grueling trek. Despite the oppressive heat, Prosperi remained in seventh place and maintained an impressive pace. The runners were closing in on the finish line at Zagora, a Berber village nestled in the palm-filled Draa Valley. Giovanni Manzo, a friend from Sicily who was running alongside him, assisted in taping up a worsening blister on Prosperi's foot. Afterward, Prosperi collected his two-liter water allocation and continued his run. Around 1 p.m., unexpected high winds whipped up a sudden sandstorm, prompting race organizers to halt the event for the day. Other participants sought refuge and eventually reached the fourth checkpoint by nightfall. However, Manzo arrived at the checkpoint, but Prosperi was nowhere to be seen. Manzo couldn't comprehend what might have happened. Prosperi had been ahead of him, and even considering the storm's delay, he should have arrived hours earlier. Nevertheless, the race officials believed that Prosperi couldn't have strayed far. According to the race regulations, in the event of a sandstorm, runners were required to stop and await further instructions. The race officials determined that a comprehensive search would commence the following morning. At first light on Friday, race staff deployed Land Rovers to comb the trail while a pilot conducted an aerial reconnaissance in an ultralight aircraft. The searchers followed a systematic grid pattern as they scoured the terrain. They recognized the urgency of the situation as Prosperi had at most only two liters of water, and by noon, temperatures would soar into the triple digits. Despite their exhaustive efforts, there was no sign of him. Mauro Prosperi had inexplicably vanished. When he began to pass through a section of the race that was dominated by small dunes, the sand around him started to lift and swirl. Small dunes, unlike large ones, walk, he says. The swirling resembled a dance, rhythmic and mesmerizing at first, but the rhythm became insistent, and before he knew what was happening, Prosperi faced a yellow wall. A huge sandstorm engulfed Mauro. I couldn't see anything. The wind blew so violently the sand hurt. Therefore, he pressed onward, attempting to find shelter several times, only to have the relentless sand engulf him each time. He continued to navigate, seeking shelter once more. The tempest persisted for seven long hours. Once it had finally subsided, there remained nothing discernible to guide his compass. The sandstorm had obliterated every conceivable point of reference. The once familiar landscape was utterly transformed. Prosperi's initial impulse was to run. He had squandered valuable time, and his primary focus remained on completing the race. I hope to at least get in the medals, he says. Nevertheless, he found it peculiar that he had not encountered a single soul. It was 1994, and the event remained relatively obscure at the time. Prosperi had been running mostly in solitude. However, he couldn't help but wonder why he hadn't crossed paths with the walkers who had departed early from the checkpoint or come across any race markers. Climbing a dune in search of signs of life, he found himself still utterly alone. As the evening approached, the unrelenting winds showed no sign of abating. He resumed running, but after a few minutes, it dawned on him that he had veered off the trail. Determined to regain his bearings, he retreated his steps, scouring the desert for the French flags that marked the route. Eventually, darkness descended upon him and he concluded that further expending his energy would serve no purpose. My only thought was that through my stupidity, I had forfeited any chance of winning the race. But I knew that I couldn't be more than a few miles from the trail, and that the rescuers would come searching for me at dawn. So I prepared a camp and lit a small fire to create light. I slipped into my sleeping bag and fell asleep under the stars. But Mr. Properi saw a silver lining in his ordeal at this point and was in awe at the desert at night. It was immediately fascinating. You have this sky that is white with stars that almost suffocates you, he recalls. On the following morning, Prosperi persisted in his run, maintaining his unwavering belief in the race and his identity as a competitor. Unaware that the race organizers had not initiated a search and realizing that his survival hinged on his own efforts, he remained resolute. At one point, the distant sound of a helicopter reached his ears, sparking hope that it had come to rescue him. The helicopter flew at a low altitude, and he could make out the pilot's white helmet. However, to his dismay, the pilot seemed oblivious to his presence. 
Carrying flares, which were small and slender, akin to a ballpoint pen, Prospery decided to take matters into his own hands. He fired a flare into the sky, unfurled the Italian flag from his backpack, and, overcome with desperation, relinquished all self-control. I ran after him. I shouted at him. I called him Paolo, Giovanni, every random name that sprang to mind. But the noise of the engine faded to a hum. Then there was silence, he said. Prosperi gradually transitioned from running to a brisk walk. He found himself engaged in an entirely new challenge, one without a predefined route or a designated finish line. His adversaries in this unexpected contest were slowly revealing themselves. With his supplies mostly consisting of dehydrated food and no water, he faced an arduous test of survival. On the second day of being adrift in the desert, Prosperi's keen eyes spotted a distant object on the horizon. I was convinced it was somebody's home or a holy man's shrine. As he drew nearer, he identified it as a marabout shrine, a deserted tomb dedicated to a revered Muslim religious leader. While the shrine didn't offer any immediate rescue prospects, it did provide much needed shade and other resources. Mauro decided to take advantage of this shelter, grateful to finally have a roof over his head. He affixed his Italian flag to the turret of the shrine, and as he settled in, he noticed an unusual sound reminiscent of tiny birds chirping. Upon investigation, he discovered a cluster of tiny bats clinging to the walls. As his food supplies dwindled to nothing, his gnawing hunger drove him to take actions he never believed he would. Prosperi was compelled to scour the surrounding area for anything edible. He resorted to consuming bird eggs, beetles, and even lizards. Matters took a grim turn when he reached a point where he had to resort to killing the bats residing in the shrine, hoping to extract any moisture that cooking their flesh might yield. With determination, he grabbed a handful of bats, squeezing them to death. Employing his small knife, he decapitated them, stirred their insides, and sucked out whatever sustenance they could offer. This grim routine continued with approximately 20 bats. This way, I ate and drank at the same time, he says. Afterward, he carried the bat remains out of the shrine and buried them. This was an act of respect for the shrine and the bats, and perhaps it felt important to impose a ritual of civilization upon what had just occurred. That's how I am, very ordered in things, and it seemed just to me, if I have to kill an animal to live, I will bury the remains, he said. The anti-diarrhea medication he carried in his backpack proved invaluable in preventing further water loss despite his unconventional and limited diet. To quench his thirst, Prosperi resorted to unconventional means such as sucking on damp wipes from his pack, licking morning dew from rocks, and consuming his own urine while it remained relatively clear. In a resourceful move, he also utilized urine for rehydration and cooking his freeze-dried food, as no other water sources were accessible. At the sound of another aircraft, he hurriedly stepped outside to kindle a fire. I made a hole in the sand. I put in all my things, sleeping bag, rucksack. Plastic things make smoke. Unfortunately, as soon as it was lit, another sandstorm hit. I felt so much anger in my body, he recalled. He waited 12 hours inside the Maraboot for the storm to pass, and the next day came to a decision. In Italy, if they don't find the body of the presumed dead, the family doesn't receive a payout. Since he was a policeman, his wife would have been entitled to his state pension. Prosperi decided that the sensible course of action was to cut his veins. If he bled to death in the marabout, his body would be found and the pension paid. Slowly, slowly, I will fall asleep and die, he thought. It sounds like an act of despair, but Prosperi says it was the product of great anger and acuity. He only had a small knife. But Mauro commenced with cutting his veins and waited inside his shelter to die. Prosperi woke the next morning to find that due to extreme dehydration, the blood had clotted almost immediately at his wrists. I thought it is not my moment. I am not to die here. I will head towards the mountains. From that point onward, his determination to survive surged, and he did everything in his power to ensure his survival. He foraged for rodents and serpents in the area, resorting to consuming large ants, chewing on leaves, and modifying his running shoes by cutting the backs to alleviate the sores on his heels. In a last-ditch effort to reach safety, Prosperi departed from the shrine and commenced a journey toward distant mountains. He embarked during the early morning and late evening hours to evade the scorching daytime heat. Along the way, he strategically left fragments of his gear behind as markers, akin to a trail of breadcrumbs. Although he believed these mountains lay along the Marathon's trail, 
This route inadvertently took him deeper into the vast Sahara. In the profound and desolate silence of the desert, the only companion he had at times was the faint hiss of the wind. As he traversed arid riverbeds, he resorted to extracting moisture from plant roots. Then, after enduring eight grueling days in the unforgiving desert, Prosperi stumbled upon a desert oasis. Really, it was only a large puddle, a mirror of water in a wadi. I threw myself upon it and gulped with abandon, but I could hardly swallow. I managed to force a mouthful of it down, and almost immediately I vomited. I couldn't hold anything. I found I had to take tiny sips, one every ten minutes. After satisfying his thirst, Prosperi replenished his water container and resumed his journey. Over time, he came across some desiccated goat excrement and persisted in his search for additional signs. These dung markings eventually guided him to the presence of human footprints. On the ninth day, he spotted something in the distance. Dromedaries, he thought. As he grew closer, he realized they were goats. He was about 200 meters away when he saw that they were being herded by a girl. He had reached a Berber settlement. I understood then that I was reborn. I'd been in the desert nine and a half days. I felt I'd been inside the belly of the desert like a pregnancy. I was born anew. The Berber families gave him goat's milk, which he vomited up because it was too much after days of starvation and dehydration. Prosperi had trekked all the way to Algeria, crossing through a border region riddled with landmines. Suspected of being a foreign agent, military police blindfolded him and transported him to a base in Tindu. Later, he was admitted to a hospital where he spent a week in intensive care. Reports indicated that Prosperi shed 35 pounds during his ordeal, weighing a mere 99 pounds when he was ultimately rescued. Medical professionals noted that his liver had nearly completely failed, and he received 16 liters of intravenous fluids from the hospital staff. Upon reuniting with his family and receiving a warm welcome in Italy, Prosperi's recovery proved challenging. He struggled to consume solid food for several months after his harrowing experience and claimed that it took almost two years for him to fully recuperate. Back in his hometown of Rome, he posed for photographs alongside his wife. During this time, a sports journalist who had known him as an Olympian inquired, so will you run the marathon again? To which Prosperi responded, I always finish my races. True to his word, Prosperi gradually rebuilt his strength over the subsequent two years and made a remarkable comeback to compete in the Marathon des Sables in 1997. Remarkably, he went on to complete the race an additional nine times with his last participation occurring in 2017. Several adventurers and journalists have cast doubt on the veracity of Prosperi's account, given the seemingly extraordinary nature of the feats he described. Some have suggested that he might have either staged or embellished the ordeal for financial gain and publicity. Patrick Bauer, the founder of the Marathon des Sables, even went as far as declaring to Men's Journal that he believed the story was a fabrication and physically implausible. These assertions prompted Prosperi to contemplate legal action against Bauer, although he eventually decided against it, characterizing the dispute as a personal matter rather than a legal one. Nevertheless, the documented physical trauma Prosperi endured was undeniably excruciating and it left lasting effects on his body with a visible scar on his wrist, allegedly from his suicide attempt in the desert. Documentary crews have returned to the Maraboot Shrine and uncovered bat skeletons along with abandoned personal items that substantiated his narrative. The tale of Mauro Prosperi's survival might strain credulity for some. Even according to his own recollection, he made decisions that would have ostensibly diminished his prospects of staying alive. Nonetheless, after enduring nine days in one of the planet's most unforgiving environments, Prosperi managed to eke out a narrow path to safety, an achievement that is undeniably remarkable. Commonly, people associate deserts with death. However, in Mauro Prosperi's case, the opposite held true. He stated, I say to a lot of people, if you really want to understand life, you have to go to the desert. If you have a life that you can't interpret, you become alone. Everything felt amplified my love of nature, my love of sport, the will to do, the love of life. Surviving in the Sahara Desert demands more than just physical preparedness. It requires a deep reservoir of resilience and adaptability. The desert is a formidable adversary, but it is also a teacher. Respect the sun's searing heat, the biting cold of the night, 
and the scarcity of water. In every challenge, there is an opportunity to learn, adapt, and grow stronger. In the desert, water is your most precious resource. Conserve it diligently, savor every drop, and never underestimate its value. Embrace the wisdom of the desert. Water is life, and life is to be cherished. The desert rewards innovation and resourcefulness. Learn from the nomadic communities that have thrived here for centuries. Discover how to find water sources, build shelter from the elements, and make the most of what the desert offers. In the vast expanse of the Sahara or any desert, it's easy to become disoriented. Hone your navigation skills, whether through the stars, sand dunes, or natural landmarks. The desert becomes less daunting when you can find your way. Your mental resilience is your greatest asset. Cultivate a mindset that thrives on challenge, embraces discomfort, and finds beauty in simplicity. Your thoughts can be a wellspring of strength. In the desert, every mile covered and every drop of water found is a triumph. Celebrate these small victories, for they are the stepping stones to survival and success. The journey through the Sahara is a test of endurance, but it's also a testament to the human spirit's indomitable will. Never lose hope, for within its flicker lies the strength to overcome. In the challenges of desert survival, you'll discover your inner fortitude, and in its vastness, you'll find a profound connection to the beauty and resilience of our natural world. Surviving the Sahara is not just about physical survival, it's a journey of the soul, a testament to the limitless capacity of the human spirit to endure and thrive. Essential tips so you can navigate an outdoor disaster. Thank you for watching. Want more outdoor disaster content? Check out these stories I believe you'll enjoy.